All right. Good evening. Welcome everyone to the fourth ever and first Hispanic Heritage Month Dialogue for Peace and Progress presented by the City of Kyle. My name is Dex Ellison. I'm a city council member here in the City of Kyle, and I'm honored to moderate this fourth dialogue for you all this evening. Uh, so this is our fourth one. So uh, uh, some of you all may have seen these before, uh, but some of the, you all, this may be new to you. And so we're going to go over the rules here just uh, in a moment. But uh, we're excited to have this opportunity to discuss Hispanic Heritage Month, uh, the cultures and contributions of Hispanics and Latinos in our uh, community, uh, both locally and across the state and across the country. So with the Dialogue for Peace and Progress, the idea behind it is to give a platform to those that don't typically have a megaphone or a platform in our community, uh, but our contributors to our community do great things in our community, are a big part of our community, and give them an opportunity to share their thoughts about various different topics. Uh, sometimes uh, topics we don't talk about, taboo topics, and uh, sometimes difficult topics to talk about, but still important topics to talk about. And the way to learn is truly having conversations with those that uh, both you uh, know and see all the time, and sometimes folks that you don't see all the time. So that's a bit of the idea behind this. Uh, I'll go over the panel, uh, the paddles here, because the panel will be using these. Uh, because it's a dialogue and we want to give everybody an opportunity to uh, share their thoughts, on one side we will have I Choose to Speak, which will uh, inform the audience and myself that that panelist will want to comment on that particular topic. We also have on the other side, I Choose to Listen. Because this is a dialogue and listening is an important part of a dialogue, sometimes it is about listening and understanding from those around you. So those would be what the panel has. Next, I'd like to tell about the Mentimeter questions. So this is an opportunity for our audience both here and watching online to participate. We have at menti.com, that's www.menti.com, will be where you will want to go. And we have a code that we'll put up. There it is, 65864984. So menti.com and use code 65 eight six four nine eight four there will be questions that we will put up on the screen throughout the evening for the audience to participate uh, and so we'll also have an opportunity hopefully for the panel to reflect on what the responses were from our, our audience as well so be prepared for those so with that being said we have a lot to cover this evening and a lot to talk about so I'm going to go in and introduce our panel and then we'll get right into the conversation with us this evening, virtually, we'll start with our two virtual panelists. We have Marcelina Rodriguez Garcia, and she goes by Marcy. She is a graduate of Texas State University, San Marcos, Texas, with a, with a Bachelor of Arts major in History and a minor in English Literature. She also holds an Associate and Bachelor's Degree in Theology from the Latin American Theological Seminary and an Associate of Arts from Austin Community College, Austin, Texas, during which time she went, underwent three heart surgeries during that time. That's incredible. She retired from the medical field specializing in dialysis in 2005. She was born in Illinois and raised in the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas. She is married and has five children and one heart child. She lives in Kyle, Texas with Alfred, her husband of 43 years. Her first published book, uh, for first published work, A Portrait of Mexican-American Civil Rights in South Texas from 1930 to 1979 made its debut this summer. She is currently working on her second book. Thank you, Marcy, for being with us this evening. Thank you. Our other virtual panelists, Dr. Claude Bonacio uh, Romaguera. Forgive me for if I, I butchered that, but is originally from San Juan, Puerto Rico, and moved to Kyle four months ago from Cedar Park. Uh, Claude is a, receives his bachelor's and mas master's at Texas State University, go Bobcats, and his PhD at the University of Texas at Austin in sociology. He is currently a full-time lecturer in the sociology department at Texas State University and an adjunct at the Austin Community College. His research interests are in race and ethnic relations, education, and health. Dr. Claude, thank you for being with us this evening. Next, we will go to our in-person pan uh, in panelists. Front and center, we have Ms. Angie Velasquez, Mexican-American activist, community organizer. 
She's a LULAC District 2 Deputy Director for Young Adults, Captain for Powered by People, and she is an advocate for survivors of human trafficking, sexual assault, and domestic violence. Thank you for your work in our community, Angie, and thank you for being here this evening. All right, here to my far right, and the panel's left, we have Mr. Richard Alexander Dick Dixon. He was born in Panama City, Panama. Coach Dixon, as I like to call him, has lived in the U.S. since he was six years old. He is a proud father, stepfather to seven, five girls and two boys, grandfather to one, and husband to Karina Dixon. Uh, he has two older brothers, one younger brother and a sister. He is an avid lover of sports, his family, friends, the beach, and just relaxing. Who's not a fan of that? He currently works at UT and is a diehard Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Welcome to the panel again, uh, Mr. Dixon. Next here on the panel, we have Mr. Jesus Jimenez. Uh, Mr. Jimenez was the high school valedictorian for 2021 at Hayes High School. Currently, he is a student at the University of Texas at Austin studying neuroscience. He is involved in the pre-medical Latinx health professions organization, and he plans to attend medical school, medical school and study neurology in the future. Thank you, Jesus, for being with us this evening, our youngest panelist tonight. Next, we have Dr. Octavio Pimentel, joined the Masters uh, in Rhetoric and Composition program in the Department of English at Texas State University in 2005. Since his arrival, he has taught thousands of students, published five books and 30 articles. He has also presented his work at over 100 national and international conferences. Also used to coach with this uh, uh, gentleman at the, for the Kyle Invaders, and so happy to be reunited with him this evening. Thank you for being with us, doctor. All right, moving along. We have Mr. Ruben Castaneda. He is a deputy public defender for Travis County Juvenile Public Defender Office. He came to Central Texas almost 40 years ago and has made college home since 2004. His wife, Grace, is a teacher with Hayes CISD. His son, Charles, is a high school, uh, Hayes High School graduate. Professionally, Ruben defends children in Travis County, juvenile court. He is also a founding member of the Kyle Culture Awareness Group. Thank you, Mr. Castaneda, for being here again. Two-time panelist for us as well. He was on our inaugural one last June 2020. Next, we have Mr. Benita Pereira, born in Galveston, Texas, works for the city of Kyle, developing and building our awesome and amazing trail system. He's a married father of two wonderful children, enjoys family time. Uh, he's a father. He came to, his father came to the United States from Durango, Mexico, to have a better life. And, and for his children as well. And Benito, we're so excited to have you a part of the panel. Thank you for your interest. And certainly last but not least, our special guest this evening. I'm honored to uh, have one of my colleagues, Council Member Michael Tobias, as one of our panels, uh, panelists this evening. He's a third generation from the city of Kyle, the Tobias family, very well known in the city. Parents are Rosario uh, and Angelita Tob Tobias, uh, he, and he is a uh, following their footsteps, being involved in the community. Many of y'all might know Tobias uh, Elementary uh, as well, which is uh, named after his father. Longtime resident serving on city council since February 2020. To, uh, Councilmember Tobias, along with his wife, Teresa, are raising their family of three children, one attending Texas State and the other attend Hayes C CISD schools. Thank you, Councilmember, for being here this evening. All right. We've gotten through those discussions. Thank you, everyone. We're going to jump into a brief video explaining Hispanic Heritage Month and what we are celebrating this evening. Hola, chicos. Let's learn about Hispanic Heritage Month and why we celebrate it here in the United States. Hispanic Heritage Month starts on September 15th and it ends on October 15th. During this 30-day period, we celebrate the histories, cultures, and contributions of American citizens whose ancestors came from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. Hispanic Heritage Month actually started as Hispanic Heritage Week in 1968 by President Johnson. However, 20 years later, in 1988, President Reagan passed a public law to celebrate for 30 days. Now the Hispanic Heritage Month starts on September 15th and that is very important because on that day, Costa Rica, 
El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua celebrate their Independence Day. On top of that, Mexico celebrates their Independence Day on September 16, Chile on September 18, and Belize on September 21st. Within this 30-day period, we also celebrate El Día de la Raza, also known to us as Columbus Day, on October 12th. Hispanic Heritage Month pays tribute to the generations of Hispanics and Latinos who have positively influenced and enriched our nation and society. Hispanics have contributed to the American life since the American Revolution, fighting in every war since then. Latinos today continue to advance our communities across the countries. Now during this time, you should take some time to learn more. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Happy Hispanic Heritage Month, everybody. Remember when Texas had that record snowstorm in February? I do remember that. Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right. So just a little bit uh, brief history on Hispanic Heritage Month and how it came about uh, and what we are celebrating and recognizing uh, in part this evening. So uh, we'll get started with the conversation on starter topics, but first I'd like to announce the Hispanic Heritage Month uh, theme for this year, which is Esperanza, a celebration of Hispanic heritage and hope per the National Council of Hispanic Employment Program Managers, or NCHEPM. So that is the uh, theme for this year. And so it talks about a celebration of Hispanic heritage and hope. Uh, and so I'd like to get the panel's thoughts on to you, what is that hope that it's talking about? What does Hispanic Heritage Month mean to you? What do you feel is important to recognize and or celebrate? Do we sufficiently recognize or celebrate the contributions and influence of Hispanic and Latinos? And where can we approve on that? So those are the conversation starters. The panel will certainly take those discussions wherever they might go. And so right now, we'll go ahead and get those paddles up. All right, give me just a moment to get everybody. I'm gonna go, um, okay, okay, all right. Okay, I'm good. So we got two, uh, two ready to speak, so we're gonna go right into those two. So I'm gonna start with my veteran, uh, Mr. Castaneda, uh, from our first panel. Uh, how about you go ahead and start us off? Okay, <clears throat> having a little technical difficulties, but I finally got the mic turned on. Um, thank you, Dex, for holding this, and it's been my pri privilege to participate in the past, and it is again today. Uh, the theme for this year on Hispanic Heritage Month is hope, uh, and that particularly resonates with me. Um, themes in the past have been included, be proud in, of your past, embrace the future, uh, and also serving our nation. But uh, hope, it, like I said, particularly resonated with me because I believe that my Hispanic heritage, my culture is deeply rooted in hope. And if you don't mind, I would like to share a story about a man and his hope. Uh, this man was born in Mexico in poverty. Uh, being the oldest boy as a child, he had to grow up quickly when his father died and he hoped to take care of his siblings and his widowed mother. And so he did what uh, most people would do. He tried to make things better. So he, uh, as a teenager, uh, a young man, crossed the border from Mexico into the United States. Uh, he would be what many would call derisively today an illegal alien but he crossed to make a better life and he did many things. One of the things he did as a young man, still a teenager, is he enlisted in the United States Army. He lied about his citizenship. He enlisted and he served. He served, he was old enough to catch the tail end of World War II. He continued to serve, he served in the Korean War. And after serving and working his way up the ranks, he, um, decided he had to tell his commanding officers about the lie that he told, that in fact he was not an American citizen, but he was a citizen of Mexico. Because he worked so hard, served so honorably, what he got was help in uh, getting his citizenship. And he was uh, 
discharged under honorable conditions. So his hope to continue helping his siblings and his mom continued, and he did what many, this is story told thousands of times, he worked wherever he could, whether it be 16-hour shifts at a restaurant in Kansas City or going over to California and working La Pisca, which is the picking of fruits and vegetables, or working at a cannery, uh, canning those fruits and vegetables. He did that, and he did make the, his, life, his life better in his, uh, the lives of his siblings and his mom. He met the girl of his dreams in Texas, settled down, had a family, and he continued that hope and instilled that in his children, four children. He put education first. He knew that was important. His children grew up, and he and his wife did a great job because among the four, they have six college degrees, four bachelor's, two postgraduate degrees. The grandchildren have continued that. All of his grandchildren either have their college degrees or are, are attending university to achieve that. When this man passed away in 2005, he was buried in Fort Sam Houston. Think about that, a quote unquote illegal alien buried with military honors in Sam Houston, where he rests today with his wife. It's personal for me because I'm talking about my father, Alfonso Castaneda, who hoped to make a better life for himself and his children, and he did. And my task, my obligation, is to continue that hope and continue that to the next generations and to people who don't have hope, because if you're hopeless, you won't go anywhere, but you need to have hope and you need somebody to instill it in you. So thank you once again, Dex, for allowing me to speak and share the, this message. And I am so grateful that um, the theme is hope because that is very personal to me. Wow. Hearing that story gave me chills. I don't know if anybody else felt that way. I could certainly sense the pride and gratitude you had in telling that story. That was very powerful. And you, you brought up being proud of the past and embracing the future. That, that's a very powerful statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Castaneda, for sharing that with us this evening. Next, we're going to go to Dr. Octavio. Uh, tell us your thoughts on, on HOPE, the Hispanic Heritage Month theme, and, and the other, uh, any other thoughts you had this evening. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dex, for you know, putting this together and the rest of the council uh, members. Uh, I do want to start off with that I'm a very proud uh, first-generation Mexicano here. Parents are from Jalisco, from, well, from uh, Zapotitic, Jalisco, and from Ecuadorio, Michoacán. Um, I transferred from California and went from California to Utah to over here. That said, um, I'm very part, and I prefer using the word Latino in, in all honesty, so if I, you, you see me using that word, I mean, it's an interchangeable term somewhat. Um, but what's important here to realize, and I, and I, and I, and I like the idea of, 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 the, of the effort that we're here, having here, and I, lo I love the, the story how it came from one week to a month and stuff like that. But the question I have is to understand the idea of her, you know, Hispanic Month in a sense. To me, it makes a lot more sense to be just be included in a, in a year basis, and we don't have one month to try to basically implement as much Hispanic stuff as we can in one month, and then after that, we forget about it. So I think that's something that we should, I mean, and I know it's, it's steps, you know, who knows, maybe next year we'll have a three month celebration, six month celebration, I have no idea. But what I'm saying is for us to be really critical about that and to understand that for us to basically be implemented into one month, although it's a start, it, you know, it's, this happened, I believe you said in 1980, right, when, uh, with uh, Ronald Reagan. It's been uh, 40 years, I think it's, maybe we could get three months out of it or something. But again, the point being is here, there's a lot of Latinos here uh, and it's time for us to really understand that we're part of this community and part of it or anything, and that we're Americans, you know, like it or not. Uh, I know some, a lot of times when people look at us, they don't really, you know, identify us as, uh, as American and stuff like that. So, you know, I want, you know, you know again, I applaud the effort, but I would wish that we would continue doing this and re realize that there's a lot of community members that are very proud Latinos out there and that, you know, hey, let's rec be recognized all the time, right? <laughs> Really strong points there. Uh, I remember in our dialogue we had in Black History Month, we kind of talked about this as well, uh, Coach, you were on that panel, and uh, how it's, even with Dr. Woodson had only wanted it to be temporary until it got into the core uh, curriculum, and I think that's Dr. Octavio's point, is it needs to be 
in the core curriculum, and it's there all year round. So really, really good thoughts there. Uh, we're going to go ahead and jump into the Minty question, because those are all that put up the paddle so far. I'll definitely get some more thoughts here in just a moment. But let's go ahead and put up the first Minty question for our audience participation. And once again, it's Minty.com, and use code 65864984. And the Minty question is, what is the importance why is it important to recognize Hispanic Heritage Month? And so we'll give the audience, both in person and online, a chance to go ahead and pop in their answers there. While they're doing that, does anyone else on the panel uh, want to jump into the discussion uh, here as well and comment on anything that's been said or, or some additional thoughts? I'll go ahead and uh, have the paddles if you do want to speak up. All right. Virtual panelists, I see Dr. Claude. Okay, all right, we'll go ahead. Okay, all right, both my virtual panelists. So let's go ahead and uh, go here in uh, the chambers with Coach Dixon, your thoughts. So um, <clears throat> again, a great event to have. Uh, myself, I personally take pride in this because, you know, being Panamanian, full-blooded Panamanian, both my parents, uh, and coming to the United States, it was my mom's ambition more than anything else to do better, uh, to find better, uh, to see what that looks like on the other side instead of um, being where we were at at the time when she was raised and, um, and my father and all that. And being that we're here and I have cousins now and we live throughout the United States, my dad served in the military, um, and uh, I cultural or something that that I always ran into and the education of my culture was never really ever told. I learned it through school. I learned it through talking to friends. So uh, I sit up here on this panel, you know, excited to hear and listen because my story is, I guess you can say from, you know, layman's terms, it's from the street. You know, I, 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 I learned about Panama. Uh, I went to school there. I was a great student there, and I came to the United States, and I was a boxer there. I played soccer there, and then I fell in love with this sport called football. Uh, and if it wasn't for that sport, I don't know where else I would be because it, it, it enlightened me to a lot of things that are going on uh, for me personally. Um, and uh, I, I just now just like a sponge to everything, um, meeting great people that have crossed my path, my journey through my life has been fantastic, uh, whether it's sports or just in a neighborhood. And would I ever thought that I'd be sitting on a panel with these great people? And and no, no, that that's that's no, nothing that came to my mind. I was all all about playing football and being the first to graduate from college in my family um, was my goal, uh, and I attained that. And through that, now I can use that platform of education with my kids, which they all are going through school or have already graduated. And um, it's, it's some to where you look at culture and, you, and heritage, it's, it gets lost, right? Because as Dr. Pimentel said, it's, it's, we're Americans, you know, and we're here. So how do you blend? You know, some cultures don't want to blend. They stay in their culture. Uh, they stay there and don't know that our society is one that needs to blend in order to be successful. So this is where we're at. We're all working amongst each other, so we just can't turn it off and then go live that life and then come back and live this life, not if we want to be successful, in my opinion. Um, so this is more of an educational sponge moment for me uh, because I get to listen and grow and, and kind of validate a lot of the things that I've learned um, growing up and uh, being in a single parent home uh, and traveling to New York to visit my dad and, and understand that, that culture. And then with my mom here uh, with three kids and, and trying to deal with us and all of what teenage boys like to do and all that good stuff in California. Um, it, it's, it's just amazing and I'm thankful for that. Uh, but learning about culture is something that I've always challenged because it's, it's 
for those who have the family, you got that center grab, you got that center there, someone there to, you know, usually it's usually that grandmother or that grandfather that was really drilling it in and, uh, and you learn about it and you learn about the food and you learn about what happens and what this day is important, why this day is important. Um, those things still amaze me to this day when I hear about it. And it doesn't matter what culture it is. Uh, it's, you know, we're talking about Hispanic culture right now. And so now I'm, I'm all in on, on that aspect of things because it is different. You know, we, we listen to music and, you know, the way we dress. And I see a lot of the panels here wearing the same type of clothes that I would wear in Panama. You know, and, and that amazes me that it's, it's not, we're not that far from each other. You know, and uh, it's just territory is what we're talking about. And I'm, I'm just blessed to be in this part of this at this moment. Thank you, Coach. We're happy to have you here as well. And uh, I think that's a good transition to uh, one of our virtual panelists, uh, Marcy. Uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to see the interview uh, that uh, our staff did with Marcy, it's on our Facebook page and our City of Cal YouTube channel. It's not that long, but it is very powerful and it's very candid. And I certainly appreciate Marcy uh, sharing her, uh, her story with us through that. But uh, Marcy uh, did uh, recently uh, become an author and write a book and talks about her education and learning about some of the things that the panel has talked about. So Marcy, uh, how about you share a little bit about your experience and some of your thoughts about this discussion tonight? Well, um, <clears throat> I just wanted to say that um, I grew up in South Texas and um, uh, Hispanic Heritage Month really brought quite a bit of excitement to me because to me, it's, it's a chance to bring awareness about our culture, uh, especially to our young people. Uh, when I was doing all the research for the book that I wrote and the book that I'm writing, in the back of my mind, I keep thinking, our young people in the educational system need to hear these stories, as in particularly uh, our Mexican-American, Hispanic students, because many of them don't know any of this history. They don't know um, a lot of the things that have occurred over time and how we came to be where we are today. But one of the things that uh, one of our panelists was, uh, was sharing his story about his father being an illegal alien and coming to this country reminded me of um, the interview that I made with um, Antonio Orendain. Antonio Orendain, uh, was a uh, young boy living in Mexico. And uh, he says that he would sit, that he would sleep under the stars with his, his grandfather and ask him so many questions about, you know, the stars and, and about, um, he said they had a newspaper that he would read and he would ask his grandfather questions about that newspaper. And the newspaper was about uh, events in America. Uh, eventually, he became a teenager and he uh, migrated to the United States through California and ended up working in the, in the fields uh, uh, in California and met um, Cesar Chavez and uh, Irene Huerta. And uh, through the um, um, mentorship of Sela Linsky and others like him, um, they were able to learn how to organize and advocate for farm laborers. Eventually, uh, Antonio Rendain ended up in South Texas, where I'm from. And uh, he was involved in the melon strike of uh, Rio Grande City and the onion strike in Raymondville. Um, and as I was talking to him, uh, it struck me that here was uh, a man who came to this country illegally looking for a way for his family to survive. And over time, he did it. Eventually, he became the um, Texas Farm Workers founder, uh, the Texas Farm Workers Union founder in South Texas. All of his children are college educated. They're all attorneys, they're doctors. Um, from a man who had no education, but uh, he learned um, under the stars from his father what he needed to survive. And uh, hearing that story um, reminded me of Antonio Rendain 
uh, it, it's uh, Antonio Rendaine is a person that I have n had never heard before my research and have heard very little about, but I believe is a person uh, to be recognized and acknowledged. And Hispanic Heritage Month gives us that opportunity. Well, wow, very well said, Marcy. Thank you. And we appreciate you being on the panel um, and uh, as well as uh, your book is in our Cal Public Library. So you can check that out. Before we go to uh, Dr. Claude, I'm going to get you in uh, next here. But let's go ahead and show the responses from the mentee. Question. We'll give the panel an opportunity to review through those. A lot of thoughts there, anywhere from one word of understanding to uh, some that wrote a short novel. That's okay, though. That's good. I like the thoughts behind this. That is really good. All right. <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, so, Dr. Clark, we'll get you in, certainly uh, share your thoughts about the discussion, or if anything jumped off the page from what the audience presented as well, feel free to comment on that. But we'll get you in uh, next year. Well, thank you, uh, Councilman, for having me in this meeting. I'm incredibly grateful to be a part of the, this discussion. Thank you for all our panelists to be, to be able to share this space and talk about uh, many of the issues among the Hispanic and Latino community. And so one of the things that, oh, well, first of all, to give you some background about me, uh, I was originally born in Puerto, San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, and, and when I was 10 months old, we moved to Houston, Texas, lived there for 10 years. Then we moved back to Puerto Rico and lived there for 10 years. And then I eventually moved to Austin and then eventually to uh, Cedar Park. Um, but much of who I am was essentially formed in my adolescent years in Puerto Rico uh, in terms of being loud, having good time, being social. Um, it is, it's, it's, it's part of my blood, you know, dancing merengue, salsa, reggaeton, whatever you can talk about, I was there doing that. And um, as I, you know, migrated back, I, one of the first things I noticed is people don't know their neighbors. They don't talk to their neighbors. They kind of keep to themselves. And this is largely part of, you know, the value in American life, that the idea of individualism. Um, but, I, you know, in Puerto Rico, it was a community. And we lived in a building with 15 floors, four apartments in each floor. And everybody knew everybody. And everybody supported each other when we need it, in the good and the bad, in lo bueno y lo malo, right? Um, and another thing that has struck me since I started teaching here, uh, both at ACC and at Texas State, is how much many students do not know anything about their Latin or Hispanic, um, you know, background or history, right? And you know, we need to formally integrate this in our educational system, right? And not just keep a white narrative. Um, um, we need to make it, normalize it in such a way that we start learning about it from elementary school, middle school, high school, and then, you know, continue further uh, in college. But we're only waiting until they get to college to really unpack some of these experiences and these lived histories. And by that time, you've essentially formulated a particular about a, a part of your identity and your understanding of history, which kind of blurs what is actually going on. Um, and so students are surprised in the stories of how Latinos and Hispanics have uh, the many struggles that they have uh, faced both politically uh, and culturally, right? Um, and now we're even in a space where, or at a time, excuse me, when there is an anti-critical race theory debate trying to ignore the lived histories of people of color and Latinos and Hispanics, right? And this attempt to kind of brush under the rug the many ways that the United States 
has given and taken away rights from Hispanic and Latino people, right? And so in my race and ethnicity class, we go and I essentially this whole give and take process, you give a little, take away more, you give a little, take away more. And it's, people don't know how that is incredibly powerful in terms of our present experiences, right? And this is all structural. I'm a, I'm a sociologist, so we talk about society and the structure and how that reproduces aspects of inequality. Um, but yeah, we need to informally integrate and not you know, formally all, integrate all the subgroups that exist in the United States, right? Uh, from people from, uh, from Puerto Rico, Cuba, Dominican Republic, uh, parts of Latin America, we need to incorporate that and normalize the understandings of these different groups. And I would also expand that to other uh, groups of color, right? You know, we need to normalize it so that people understand and not come to an interaction with at any real knowledge about who they might be interacting with, right? All right, I've talked a lot, so I'm gonna stop. No, man, that's, that's good stuff. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for being here as well. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about education a lot of the responses from the panel. Uh, and certainly I want to continue, uh, if the panel wants to continue to discuss that, it's, it's obviously a very important piece of uh, this topic. But another thing that I, I, I presented to the panelists, a question, and it talked about identifying. And earlier in Dr. Octavio Bimentel's response, he talked about Latino, and that was his preference of, of uh, identifying. Uh, certainly, we know whether it's census or uh, job applications and different things like that, there are identifiers on that. But I was curious, does, does the panel have an idea or comments or thoughts about Hispanic versus Latino versus uh, there's also Latinx being used now as well in various different things, uh, Chicano, Mexican-American, Pan-American. Pan How do you, uh, do you see that you're identified in the general world? And then how do you all identify in your homes and with your family and amongst your peers and things like that? So uh, that was the next uh, topic of discussion. And certainly uh, I'm open to paddles here as well. So I'll get the panel to hold up their paddles. All right. Let me just get these down real quick. And, and Dr. Claude, all right, all right. Okay, so we'll get in, uh, so Angie, we haven't heard from you yet, so we'll let you lead off on this topic. Yes, ma'am. So uh, talking about uh, identifying how you are uh, identified publicly, you know, with census or job applications or just generally how the world identifies, how comfortable are you with those things? How do you identify yourself personally amongst your family, Hispanic, Latino, Latinx? What, what terms are, do you feel are most appropriate? Okay, I think this is a great question. Um, first, I'd like to start off by saying I personally am not offended by any of the labels. I do have friends from, from other backgrounds who are like, is it wrong to say Mexican? And they're, they're scared because there's so many. And, uh, and then, but I do have a personal opinion about where some of these new names come from, you know, like Latinx. Um, I, I understand it, and I hope he'll touch on it, it that it came from Puerto Rico. So well, I'd like to learn more about that. But um, I, I, I like to be called a Chicana. I'm a Mexican-American activist. And so when I say that, um, it lets a lot of people, they kind of think like, oh, you're radical. But I, I'm so proud of who I am. And so I'm not afraid to, to call myself a Chicana. I grew up, you know, with activist parents in Uvalde, Uvalde, Texas. Like, my dad was a teacher in Crystal City during the heart of the, the La Razonida movement. But he and my mom met in... Um, 
in San Angelo at Central High School and then went to Dallas where he went to college at an HBCU during the civil rights uh, era in the late 60s and he graduated like in 70 or 71. And uh, so I'm actually named after Angela Davis. So I have some of that Black Panther inspiration in me, but then we moved when I was four to Uvalde and, uh, and then I have like the Razonida movement in me. So, uh, and it's never gonna leave me. So I, those names growing up at Seven going, you know, Viva la Raza and Chicano Power. That's that's part of, probably part of the reason I like the term Chicana. But um, so, but when I hear, you know, uh, the other other terms that I, I'm maybe not as much a fan of, it, I've, I realize that it's inclusive because we. I think some terms, you know, like like the doctor here said, he chooses Latinos versus Hispanic. Uh, Hispanic, to me, I think like maybe some people are scared, you know, to to go deeper in, into their roots. So they're like, oh no, I'm not, I'm not Mexican. I'm Hispanic, you know, you hear that a lot. But then if we don't use Hispanic, we leave out Panamanians, right? We leave out a lot of the other, uh, what, 21 Latino uh, countries. So, um, but it's, it's really, it's, it's real important to talk about these topics and these labels. So I'm, I'm glad that question came up. I hope y'all know what I'm proud of. Absolutely, very, very, <laughs> very, well, very well said, Angie, thank you. Uh, let's see here, we also had, I'll make sure I get everyone in here. Uh, Mr. Jimenez, Jesus, you chose to speak on this one. Um, you yes. you so, cheated on a conversation. I was gonna say that, um, I'm not very educated on the specifics of differentiation between the um, like Hispanic versus Latino and stuff like that, but I will say that um, during like college exams or um, job applications, there'll be multiple lists and they'll say, um, what, I, what do you identify as? And I'll sometimes be like confused on why, I mean, the, there was limited options available, so, um, I would have to just choose the one that best fit, even though I didn't really think that really fit as me. So um, personally, I identify as Mexican. Um, my family is from Mexico, Ciudad Juarez. Um, the, we all come from there, um, Sinaloa as well. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, some of my friends from high school, they also encountered this problem that like, they didn't feel like they were, they were being properly included in what the um, the forms or the documents were saying. So um, I think it's important that there's more um, inclusivity in that regard. Thank you. Very well, very well said, young man. I, I think that's uh, mm -hmm. that can go across a lot of different boards. And I think even in your your young time here on this planet, you've already seen how. Uh, that can happen in, in the real world. So thank you for sharing your experience with that. Uh, let's see. Uh, we'll go down here on the, the my far left here, the far right of the panel. Uh, we'll get in Mr. Benito. Hello. Yeah, on the question, um, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm not offended by anything that's listed there. It's just that, like he was talking about in recent applications and, you know, anything you're drawing up, it doesn't really give you a definite on different choices. They're pretty much... Uh, constricted just one or two so but I'm proudly I like to recognize myself as a Mexican my parent, my like I said my dad's from Durango Mexico and uh, he came here to get a better life worked at a single job for 38 years straight uh, rarely missed a day you know so I mean that's where I got my work ethics from and uh, but I, I, I like all the choices I just wish there was a broader more I guess open you know, uh, choices instead of just making one or two. But there again, like I said, I'm, I'm proud to be called a Mexican. I like it. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. And then uh, we'll go ahead. Let's see. I think the only one we haven't heard from this evening is uh, Mr. Dubias. Yes. Um, thank you. I'll be real brief. Um, I, I do see a lot of times when you start seeing the Hispanic and Latino uh, labels come up, it, people would get confused. Of course, people that are not a race or a culture, they may not understand, okay, well, what is, what are you? Latino, you know, Hispanic, but then again, or, you know, what's the difference between that and the Mexican, you know? <laughs> so, um, how we, uh, how I label myself, 
Uh, if not so, like I said, I'm not, I, I try not to put labels on myself as much because I look at myself as very prideful and I, I, mean, we, I really emphasize our last name in our household, you know, and this was uh, being a Tobias. Yo soy Tobias is what my grandfather would always say. And I'm also proud to be also Garza as well. That's my mother's side of family. So I have Tobias and Garza blood in me. And I think for us, we identify a lot of ourselves with our last name. It's a very proud name. And uh, the, the difference between the Latino, Hispanic, identifying yourself as Mexican, again, I think a lot of times we just, I, for us, you know, I am Mexican-American. But for us, I, I always usually identify myself by my last name because of the proud heritage from my grandfather from San Luis Potosí and my grandfather from here in their hard work ethic. And so I usually use that in how we identify ourselves in our family. Nice. Uh, I was wondering if that would come up, the, the strength of a last name, uh, certainly. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Bias, for bringing that up. Now we'll bring in our next Minty Meter question for the audience to get participated. Uh, uh, join the participation here on this topic. So that next Minty Meter question, once again, same, same website, minty.com, using code 65864984. This question is, what do you most identify with when it comes to ethnicity? Uh, ethnicity being described as a social group that shares a common and distinctive culture, religion, language, etc. So we'll uh, allow the audience to participate in on that question while we're getting uh, their participation here. I had a couple of others that wanted to speak on this topic. We'll go over here to uh, uh, Dr. Claude. We had you uh, choosing to speak on this topic. Yes, um, one of the things uh, about these kinds of labels that we use, we need to remind ourselves that these are social constructions, right? And if you look at the census and the racial, racial and ethnic categories that have changed over time, they're largely framed in aspects of power, right? And so when I think of Hispanic, uh, I see that more as uh, coming from a colonial uh, frame more than a frame uh, that is more inclusive and is more accepting of other uh, kinds of groups, right? And so I identify with generally as Latino. Now, there's another part of my identity that I have struggled with over the years, and that's partly because um, I, I, I see people see me as white, right? And so that carries privilege in various spaces, and it was very much highlighted uh, in Puerto Rico, right? even when I was, you know, hanging out with friends and who would be singled out by the police and who would not, right? Um, and so I think we need to have an, and this debate is an ongoing debate and has been going on for years, right? Um, but I think, you know, one of the things we need to do is um, just recognize the various groups, right? Various subgroups, instead of trying to lump them all into one category. We can use Latino to kind of unite, right? To kind of see a common cause and a common movement together, uh, which I think is good, right? But we also have to recognize that the people who come into this country, come into this country in very different ways, very, very different, Latinos come here in various different ways, right? In Puerto Rico, uh, we are born American citizens and you know, for people who come from Cuba, uh, once they step on uh, the land, they get some kinds of privileges, right? Um, and then you know, people from other parts of Latin America don't have those kinds of privilege in itself, right? Um, so yeah, I think, you know, you know, in terms of Puerto Rico, you know, <laughs> one of the things that they always say, ah, no hay racismo aquí, aquí no existe racismo. Like racism doesn't work, uh, that it doesn't exist, right? We're a mixed identity, but in my experience, it was front and center um, in various spaces, depending on where you were, right? And we have these three categories, negro, blanco, trigueño, habao, right? So black, white, uh, kind of dark skinned, and then a mixed race, right? And so um, 
you know, there's various kinds of groups that exist. Anyways, yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Claude. I appreciate uh, your candor on that that discussion and talking about a little bit of the topic as well of colorism and, and things with that and that, like you said, that privilege that you saw happening with you in Puerto Rico and, and how people perceive you. Next, I want to go to, to Coach Dixon here and good transition on this. Uh, so I know f uh, I met you, what, a decade ago, and certainly uh, my ignorance saw you as just a, 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 another black man, and certainly, and then you started dropping some Spanish one day, and I was like, wow, this brother can speak some Spanish. But then I le we learned more about each other, and I learned that you were Panamanian, so that was my, my ignorance there. Uh, but certainly I want to get your thoughts on this topic, but as well uh, your experiences, you know, uh, and how things you've experienced in, in colorism and perhaps even uh, uh, how you've been treated. Sure. Um, first, I want to, I mean, one thing that hit me as soon as this topic came up was a application I was filling out the other day. And, um, and I was looking at the different things and that was on there. And so you hit Hispanic as your race and then it asks you, for another question and, and I couldn't move forward. I couldn't pass it because I'm looking at it from a standpoint because I'm, I'm married to Karina Rodriguez Dixon. And I'm looking at it from her standpoint where we had a conversation at the table and then we have this thing at our house where if there's more than five people sitting at the dinner table, it's gonna be chaos because it just turns into a a very fun, eventful, opinionated, heated conversation, no matter what the topic is. We can be talking about just whatever. And, but this came up, and on the application that I brought up was, why is it that if you identify yourself as Mexican or Hispanic, you next can't move forward until you hit white as your color? And that bothered me. Uh, and I know that's a, a systemic situation that we're dealing with, and, but I think it goes right back to what was mentioned. It's about the census. It's about power. It's about money, period. You know, uh, and so that bothered me. So we got into a conversation about that. And, and, and when you bring up my experiences, I've had them all, as you can obviously tell. Uh, you know, I. I you know, I used it as my undercover thing when I got the job at the University of Texas and I introduced myself to my staff of 35 people, most of them Hispanic, um, a manager of billing services at the University of Texas. And uh, I purposely went in there speaking Spanish. And the, the looks on everybody's face was like, wow, where did he learn that from? <laughs> you know, and, and when I explained everything, they were like, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know this was happening. Oh my God, how, did, where did you learn it? And, and it kind of goes back and forth. So my mom, when I came from Panama, I didn't know English at all. Uh, I was Spanish, full, that's all I knew. That's, and when my mom moved to the United States and I stayed back with my grandmother and my aunt uh, and she sent for me, I was immediately removed from my Spanish school that I was going to, to go to an American school so I can learn English. And when I came to the United States at six, seven years old, uh, that's all my mom would speak to me would be English. And when we had conversations about that, she would say, I want you to succeed and not struggle. Um, and, and I didn't, never understood that word struggle until you know, when you have these interactions with people and they don't understand why you know Spanish the way you do, where'd you learn it from? Oh, you didn't learn that from school because you speak it with the tongue and all that stuff. And if I go to New York, my hair, my language becomes that New York Spanish, you know, and I speak it and it's not on purpose. It just comes out that way. And, um, and so I'm in New York and I'm walking the streets and everybody's talking, I'm talking to them, they're like, where did that dialect come from? And I'm like, I don't know. It just comes out. The way I'm, 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 I, like I said earlier, I'm a sponge. Uh, I am a sponge to what's happening around me, to my environment. 
And uh, so I've met and discussed this topic with a lot of people, and it always comes down to this, you know what I said earlier. It's the powers. And, but that always bothered me when I fill out applications, whether it's for a house, a credit card, or whatever. I always look at that section, and I struggle with it because I'm, I get angry. Why are we asking these questions? Why should that even be on there? You know, and, and I challenge that. Why should it be on there? Why does, it, why does this person, whoever, need to know that I'm black, that I'm Panamanian, which isn't on there? I have to pick between Hispanic or other. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't understand that from my perspective, and I struggle with it a lot. And now when you do electronic applications, you can't even finish it unless you hit one of those buttons. It won't let you go forward. And, and uh, so I say all that to say that the, the struggle is real. Uh, it's, it's, it's a struggle that I deal with. It's, men, it's not a lot now because, like we said, our kids that are growing up, they don't really got a full grasp of understanding what that's all about because we've, we've been institutionalized as far as this is just an application, fill it out, get it done, and this is who you are. But when it comes to that box, do we educate? I mean, is the education there where it needs to be? Uh, so much has happened, both from my perspective as a, a proudful Panamanian um, and also being involved in a black community, it's, it's kind of a wow moment for me because it's like I'm getting it both ways. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter, and I'm fighting that fight because it's all about just doing the right thing and and learning about your culture is great and i and i embrace that because that's what it's about uh but being a good human being doesn't have a color to it you know it doesn't have a heritage to it you just got to be a good human being we're here in the united states i want to know i mean when i met you and 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 the story i will use will be personal and it actually has to deal with someone that's in this room right now and his wife when my kids went to elementary school at uh, Blanco Vista and I met Mr. Pimentel's kids, that was like a fantastic moment for me. I was just sitting there with a big smile on my face like I was in a candy store, you know, because here I am sitting here and I'm like, oh, this is a nice guy. That's cool. Man, he's tall. You know, you know I'm over here having all these conversations. I wonder if he was a wrestler. There's a lot of wrestlers that live around here, you know, and, and next thing you know, his kids come up and they're speaking in Spanish and I was like, Whoa, that's fantastic. You know, where are you from and all this stuff. And we got to meet each other and um, our kids grew up together. And uh, <clears throat> I will say that his kids grew up a lot. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and, and they're fantastic people, fantastic human beings. And um, not only because I had to, the great experience of coaching his son uh, with football, but just because of the interactions we had, it had never, ever been charged with anything that has to do with our culture or anything like that. It's always been the mutual respect for the individual as a human being. And just the amazement of just seeing how it, that has happened. You know, my kids get on me a lot. You don't teach us enough about our heritage. You know? and, and I said, my heritage was taken from me. So I'm learning as you guys are learning. Yes, I wish I could take you to Panama, you know, but that ticket is expensive. <laughs> you know, not when you're when you're traveling nine deep. You know, that's that's not a right. that's not a cheap that's not a cheap ticket. You know, so yeah. you know, because I wouldn't want to just be just me. I want to take everybody to to see Panama, to see everything that's happening out there. So one day that will happen. Um, but here, walking around this city, this town, going to Austin and all that stuff, I just take it all in and I'm a people person and I watch it and but I but I thrive knowing the differences that are out there and the struggles that are out there and you know we need to take our sunglasses off or the shades off of wherever we're at and understand that man this city is growing so fast that if we don't start to figure out how to get along it's not going to it's going to end up hitting a wall like what's been happening in other states you know no, that I've been in recently. It's, it's just one of those things where enjoy the culture that we have and, and embrace it. You know, uh, it's, it's a fantastic thing to learn from everybody. And it's, it's uh, you know, I talk a lot, so I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> I enjoy it. This is, this is a great topic for me.
Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you all uh, jumped on this one. I was uh, pretty curious about this myself. So thank you all for sharing your thoughts on this. We're going to go ahead and get the responses from the Mentimeter question on this topic so that uh, we can see what the audience said. Can we, we got a Chicana oh. there. Oh. Some thoughtful answers there. Okay, we're going to move right along as much as I would li love to continue to carry on that particular conversation. The idea behind these is to be a conversation starter so that the audience is watching here at home will continue these conversations amongst their family, their neighbors, their friends, their church members, and continue to have these, these dialogues. Next, we'll move into uh, this past year. So one of the things I asked the panel to do is kind of reflect on this past year. Uh, past year and a half has been difficult for all of us in some shape, form, or fashion dealing with an unprecedented pandemic. But I asked the panel to reflect on this past year, what they've learned about themselves, their community, society as a whole. Uh, how has your life been impacted or changed over this past year, both professionally and personally? And what do you feel is the best way to improve, repair, build upon communities, and have more constructive interactions with one another, dealing with stigmas, taboos and less discussed subjects that quietly impact the Latino community. community. And who all needs to be involved uh, in, with building these better relationships? And any events of the past year or anything could come up and certainly want to allow the panel to take that where they want. So we'll go ahead and get the paddles again for this one. Like everybody's eager on this one. That's good. <laughs> uh, all right, Dr. Claude, and then Marcy. What was yours? Yeah, okay, awesome. So we're, we're and we're going to start with you on this one, Marcy. Uh, I haven't heard from you in a while, so we'll get you to uh, start us off on th this uh, this next section. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so, yeah, we went through a freeze and we've been going through COVID. And um, I have just been amazed at the beauty of the community coming together to help each other this year. It's been a wonderful thing to see uh, neighbors reaching out to neighbors and making sure that everybody was well, not as um, different cultures, but as is, is humanity, as humans, as somebody else was saying. Um, and I think that is a wonderful focus for us to continue having um, is that um, when, when things get rough and people bind together as humans, uh, people get along. And, and this is great. I, I love that about, about learning that about, it, it hasn't been easy because of COVID for people to get together and, and communicate with each other like we would like. But during that freeze, people didn't care. People just wanted to be there for other people. And I think that was a beautiful thing. I concur with that, Marcy. We certainly, Councilmember Tobias and I, uh, saw this on many different levels and how our community came together, certainly our staff as well, to have everybody rally, rally around and step up in a unprecedented time like that. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, we're going to go to the other panelists. It looks like everybody had some thoughts here. But real quick, I'm going to go ahead and get the Minty question in so that the audience can go ahead and start putting their thoughts in on that. And then we'll get back to the panel. So the Minty question for this one, once again, Minty.com, 6586-4984. This Minty question is a word or two describing your impressions, feelings, or what our society and relations within our communities need now more than ever. So once again, a word or two describing your impressions, feelings of what our society and relations within our communities need now more than ever. More than ever. And we'll come back to those responses, but we'll go back to the panel here. Let's see, we haven't heard from uh, Mr. Castaneda in a while. Uh, we'll get your responses next. 
<clears throat> Thanks, Dex. Um, kind of go along with the Minty question, what does society need to improve? Um, and I think the answer is simple, but the solution maybe isn't. We need to talk. We need to have that conversation. We need to have that hard conversation. We need to talk about things that make us uncomfortable. Uh, I think about uh, up until just recently, the Tulsa race massacre that happened 100 years ago was whitewashed. And I, don't, I think it was not until uh, the HBO Watchmen brought it to the attention of the dominant culture. Uh, and we can't let whitewashing happen. Uh, we live here in Texas. I don't know how many people know in 1918 about the Por Venir massacre. Uh, that is a massacre that happened out in West Texas where um, is uh, ranch land and there was some cattle rustling going on and the ranchers accused a group of Mexican men and boys where there was no evidence of that. So the Texas Rangers got involved and they basically took them from their homes, took them out and executed them, <clears throat> killed them. And that community has been fighting for years to be recognized. Uh, many people don't know about that because it's been whitewashed. We need to not whitewash, we need to have hard conversations and we need to have those with people who are willing to listen, and we need to be willing to listen too, because we cannot progress, we cannot repair, unless we actually talk and listen and try to bridge and understand and move forward. Because otherwise, what we have is repeating history. Dr. Claude talked about critical race theory, which isn't even taught in, in uh, public schools. Um, but uh, House Bill 3979, which became law, basically outlaws that in public schools, but it's not really outlawing crit critical race theory. What my reading of the law, and I'm, you know, this is an oversimplification, but basically they don't want anything taught, those who pass the law, that will make people in the dominant culture feel bad. That's an oversimplification, but that's my take on it. And so we need to not do that. We need to talk so, and if we feel bad, we feel bad, but we progress and we move forward. So um, I know this might be kind of a buzzkill from what Marcy said, because she was so positive. Uh, but I want a positive future for my child and for my nieces and nephews. And so we need to do that. Thanks, Dex. Uh, thank you, Ruben. Uh, this is what that's about. Sometimes these conversations are difficult and uh, challenging to kind of talk about, but that, that's why we're here. That's the whole purpose of that. So thank you, sir. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's go to Dr. Octavio. We haven't heard from you in a while. Uh, you're, get you in on this part of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ruben, I'm going to jump on you as well. <laughs> follow, follow your lead. And, and sorry, Marcy. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't see things as positive as, as, we, as, as everything we've uh, mentioned. I know it's been a tough couple years. Um, but unfortunately, this time has brought up a lot of ugly, uh, a lot of ugly stuff. The whole rhetoric of close our borders. The whole rhetoric of keeping these children on the borders and uh, undocumented people because they're, they're be basically being accused of bringing these crazy diseases here. Um, so it's something we should be considered here. Um, so that's, that's the biggest thing. I, I think also, as we continue doing these things, and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm looking at his, uh, and Kyle specifically, at how we could actually be more progressive. Um, love this talk, what we're doing. But, here's the but. I don't understand why it wasn't in Spanish. All of us here are bilingual. But as Cloud was talking about, Dr. Uh, Cloud, I'm sorry, Dr. Roman Guerra <laughs> was talking about, we're keeping the dominant culture in power here by doing this panel in English. All of us are bilingual, we could switch over and do it, and we just chose not to do it. I think most of us would, would have agreed to at least do two panels, one in English and one in Spanish. So it's something for us to, to consider. And I think for us to continue doing that, and, and, and it is a whole power structure here, that we have to understand that you know we need to stop being you know, we need to stop putting uh, Latinos or Mexicanos on the margins and start really pushing their culture in somehow or another and to really question our rhetoric uh, about them. You know, it could be the whole 
argument that happened about a year ago with a change in the high school, right? Down the street, we have a middle school called Rangers. Uh, Ruben, great job talking about the Rangers, aka also known as Mexican killers. And we have a middle school named for them. This is in the history books, everyone. <laughs> it isn't like I'm making this stuff up. So we have to be, be able to be really critical about this stuff and realize, you know what, this is stuff, you know, and I know we cannot change everything overnight. But for us to be critical about this stuff and understand that there's, there's you know, we, there's definitely flaws here. And as, as Dr. Bonanza Romaguera was talking about, it is this whole power structure, the whole power structure, right? I mean, even go back, going back to a little bit to when we were talking about earlier about the census and Hispanic, we all have to understand that if, and when I'm talking about Hispanic people in general, let's, be, let's you know, I know, I know there's some, uh, some people from the, from the DR or from Panama, but the majority of us are, are Mexicanos, right? And we have to understand that Mexican people were all half European and half indigenous. Mm -hmm. We are. Mm -hmm. That's like it or not. We're all half indigenous, half European. By only recognizing Hispano, you're only recognizing my Hispanic side. And that's where the big problem is. You know, preferably I'd, I'd like to be called Chicano, Mexican, but if we're going to use a general term, in a sense, you know, it's a lot more nicer to include our Latino thing because now it includes color, it includes variation stuff, and not, not only recognizes our European side because we're all you know, two cultures. So, I, so anyways, I, I know that's a lot to talk about. I know I jumped around. <laughs> so, thank you. A learning opportunity. Uh, one about the, the massacre. I had no <laughs> idea about that. That certainly was something that I was ignorant to. And, and I appreciate the feedback and the commentary on this. That is exactly the point of these discussions. So I appreciate that. Uh, and and value, value your thoughts and opinions there. Uh, I'm going to jump in here. Uh, Angie, we haven't heard from you in a while. Let's get you in on this discussion. Okay, okay thank you. I'd be um, remiss if I didn't take this moment to thank you, sir, to thank you, Council Member um, Ellison, because this discussion is taking place because of people like you. And although it's in English, I feel like um, it, it brought something to light that's very important. We, the Hispanic community, Latino community of Hayes, we need to be having our own conversations first because there is so much going on that, um, that we have members of our Hispanic community, they're uncomfortable hearing these stories themselves. They, they are, they, it makes one that he stop it, Angie, you're, 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 you know, you're race baiting. No, I'm not. I was fortunate to grow up in Uvalde with a mentor that is like Marcy. Her name is Olga Munoz Rodriguez, and she wrote Texas Legends. And so it wasn't in the textbook or in my classes, but fortunately, this woman, since I was in second grade and got me into ballet folklorico and, and just, she, she left a, an amazing job. Her and my mom worked side by side at Southwestern Bell, and she gave up all those benefits, you know, to start her own newspaper, a Spanish bilingual newspaper, because the Uvalde Leader News, um, you can just guess who ran that one and still does. So, um, so for me to have had Olga Munoz Rodriguez as my inspirational teacher all, all through my years in Uvalde, I, I know these stories of Porvenir, and um, so I think that there needs to be more discussions, but I'm glad that you started this. It, whatever part you played in this, thank you so much, sir. But I would like to go to the, the question that you had asked about what has last year uh, done you know, to change me because of the, not just Mexican-American activists, but political activists that I've been my whole life. Um, I, last year changed me in a sense where I've put people over politics. And I saw, you know, the you know, the natural Angie, she was mad, you know, because of the pandemic and the numbers on, in Kyle making the news and, and, and e being east of I-35 where I live. And so, yeah, I was, I was right in the heart of those fights about you better get, a lot of stuff you don't know. Because one of the things about me, I never challenge or scold my own raza publicly. 
but you better believe one on one. You don't want to be in a room with me. So I've had meetings with with county leaders, local leaders saying you better get this done east of 35 or else, you know. And so once they once we started to see the opportunity for individuals to get vaccine vaccines and things and testing, um, then I, I realized, you know what? Uh, what changed me the most in the last year, this isn't even about politics or color of what party you vote with. I hate it. It's about taking care of our community and our people, and I hate seeing it politicized. I hate it. So I think that's the biggest change for me I've matured in the last year. So not everything's about politics for me anymore. It's about our people. Thank you. Wow. Very well said. And Certainly, as, as one, always uh, uh, encourage holding our uh, elected representatives accountable and, and having those conversations. So thank you for your work in our community, Andy. Uh, next, I want to get it back in our, our, our valedictorian here, uh, get him in on the discussion. We haven't heard from you in a while, Jesus. Get your thoughts on this topic. Okay, um, so first of all, um, I just wanted to talk about COVID. Um, it obviously affected most high schoolers in this area. Um, or for my generation at least, um, their senior year was virtual in a virtual form. So it wasn't, it obviously wasn't the same as it could have been. Um, I really like that the community came together and um, really um, tried to mitigate the COVID um, pandemic. But um, one thing I wanted to talk about was that during high school, I felt like this kind of stigma where like, I felt like Hispanic people and Latino people, there's like a stigma that like they can't succeed or they shouldn't succeed. Um, like um, people saw that it was really weird that like I was smart and I was doing good in school. Um, people saw that as kind of strange coming from my background. Um, they didn't expect me to succeed, I guess. And there was often um, this, it just felt like there was this like pushback on that. Um, and I think that applies to like, not only myself and this community, but like across the nation as a whole. Um, I think that um, despite that, um, I know that there's examples um, th uh, that we can succeed. Um, my father has a PhD. Um, Dr. Octavio Pimentel also has a PhD. Mm -hmm. There's people that are extremely um, successful and it shows that um, despite the stigma that exists, um, we can be, there's no, there's nothing stopping us from succeeding. I'm just going to follow up with a question back to you, young man, because you're very impressive and I, I like the way you have, have spoken uh, about this topic. How important, you brought up, you know, your, your federal panelists, your dad, uh, you have a couple of panelists, with a doctor's degree, folks that are very influential in their community. How impactful is that to you as you said you identify as a, a Mexican-American? How, how important is that for you as you've gone through your long, young life journey, seeing others that remind you of you or look like you succeed as well? Yeah, I mean, they're definitely great role, role models. They, they show that you don't have to come from a specific culture to succeed. You... Um, obviously, um, I mean, my dad didn't have much money and he was able to get his PhD despite all the um, obstacles that he faced and he continues to succeed. Um, Dr. Pimentel as well. Um, I know a lot of people who, from this community who have succeeded that are um, Latino. And I guess in a way, um, I myself tried to um, mirror that in school. Um, so. Yes, they're definitely um, role models and like um, examples that you don't have to follow the stigma or the what others um, dictate. Thank you. So how, proud to have a, a young citizen uh, representing us like that. Can I, yes, can I add something slightly? And he's very modest. When he graduated from uh, Hayes last year, he had one of the highest GPAs ever. What was it? 5.3? Five point two. So I just want to. He's a very modest, humble young man. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you, Doctor, for bringing that to light. Uh, he's going to do great things. I know it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're we're going to get uh, Benito in on this one, and then we're going to have to move to the next topic. Uh, so Benito, uh, you want to give us your thoughts here on on 
on what we've been talking about. Yeah, uh, like you said, in the past year, it was pretty tough. But I just wanted to uh, thank the city of Kyle for coming together with the Hayes food distribution that we had that year and uh, had all aspects of the staff work together and distribute out to, I don't, I don't even know the number, but I know it was a high number of uh, food when it was very scarce at the stores at that time during the ice storm, I believe. And um, with that, I mean, it, it, it opened up my eyes on how the community could work together and either you know, the Kyle leadership all the way down to staff, everybody has their hands on and it was a, it was a great time. It was, it was great to see it. Fantastic, yeah, and thank you for being a part of that. It takes a team and a village to do it. Uh, okay, so let's get the responses from our last Mentimeter question uh, to allow our audience to get their participation here. I love these word clouds. So anybody who's not familiar, the larger the word, the perhaps more it was used, uh, but certainly a number of different terms there. It's always exciting to see the experience of the lexicon of our audience. Mm -hmm. Some good ones there. Peace. Now. All right. Well, uh, well, we'll let that digest and certainly uh, think about that. We do have to move to the next uh, topic. Once again, this one, I, I would love to continue talking about this one as well. It's just the case with this. Uh, but this last one is very important to the overall dialogue as well, uh, and it's one of my most exciting parts that I put in all the dialogues, and this is talking about family and community. So we all have a family. We all relate to some kind of common unity to be our community. Uh, and so this dialogue, uh, I've spoken about this in the past, part of it was derived from my family. And this is what my family would do. We would sit around and talk about tough subjects, taboo subjects, and have a real honest and, and heated thing. And I think someone spoke earlier about uh, the family being loud. I think that was Dr. Claude. Uh, I thought that was just my family. Uh, so certainly that happens. But I wanted the panel to take about 60 seconds per panelist. So uh, unfortunately, you do have to be concise about this. Uh, but talk about your family. Does uh, what they do when celebrating holidays, whether it's more widely recognized occasions or maybe uh, close family traditional celebrations or any others you would like to share, Talk a little bit about your lineage and family history, what makes you so proud and encouraged by those you have come from. We've already had some great stories shared tonight about that. Um, and then has your family inspired you or played a role in the things you do today, uh, whether that's your profession, community work, volunteering, et cetera. So we'll go ahead and get the paddles on this. It'll be the last topic for the panel. All right. Get through here. I think it looks like mostly everybody, which is totally cool. <laughs> All right, yeah, everybody's getting in here. All right, so we're gonna go through, uh, try to get everybody in. Like I said, uh, if we can be concise with our, our, our responses, about 60 seconds per, per panelist, we'll go ahead and go back up to our virtual panelists. Marcy, we haven't heard from you in a while, so we'll get you to start off on this one also. Oh, you're muted. You're muted, Marcy. Can you hear me? Okay. So how we celebrate our family. Our family, uh, our, um, we're a family of 12. So whenever we get together, um, it's just a happy time of storytelling, sharing music, food. Um, my um, greatest mentor of all times was my mother. And if there was one thing that she instilled into us was family unity. And it's something that our family has continued to, to uh, uh, take care of doing over time is to be united as a family and be there for each other. Wow, thank that, yes, thank you, Marcia. I really appreciate that. I know from someone outside of the culture, uh, you know, I think a lot of times with my friends and different things, it's family is so important uh, in the Latino and Hispanic uh, culture and, and work ethic was brought up earlier as well. And these things are, are certainly uh, uh, come about quite a bit when we talk about this. And so thank you for sharing that, Marcy. Next, we'll go to you, Dr. Claude. Yeah, we got you muted. 
Uh, one of the traditions that we have in Puerto Rico is every year we have a big, uh, big party uh, every Christmas. And this is, you know, sometimes we can make it, sometimes we can't, but it's a huge celebration and it's our time to come together. And this is not just people living on the island, but people from all over the world that have moved to different locations, right? And so one of the things that I am most proud of in terms of our, the most, one had the most influence was my mom. Um, and she essentially brought us back to Puerto Rico to be with the family, right? And once I started to learn more about my family, one of the most important things that I learned from them is apoyar el uno al otro en las buenas y en las malas, right? That is to support uh, you know, not only your family, but the community around you in the good and in the bad, right? And, um, you know she, know, she talked about how important it is to know your neighbors, how important it is to go vi visit your tia and your tios and, and tus primos, right? And your cousins, right? Um, and everybody supported each other and it didn't matter if you did, you know, if, if you didn't agree, you were just there and you you supported regardless, right? And you know, one of the things that I've noticed is like we are so polarized in the society that it's because we generally start from a point of distinction, a point of difference, instead of starting at a point of similarity. Like, what are the common things that we have between different cultures? and different kinds of backgrounds, right? But we start from a point of distinction. And what that happens is you have this in-group, out-group dynamic of power, right? And so if we start from a point of similarity, you know, sharing the different ways we celebrate and, and come together and dance and, uh, and so forth, I think that would make a huge difference, right? Um, another thing is that I think we need to get to a point where we teach children and even adults about secular ethics, how to be respectful to others, how to be kind to the other. Kindness and compassion are incredibly power, powerful, right? And I think if we start from, you know, teaching, you know, children secular ethics, to teaching them how to be respectful and even teach them how to be, uh, uh, learn about their social emotional behavior, right? How does, you know, well, sometimes the anger that may come from, you know, certain situations, right? Um, so yeah, I think, you know, we need to work in terms of uh, bringing us such shit together and having these conversations. Obviously, COVID has actually uh, really prevented that for, for people to come together. And it's it's been incredibly hard for me because I love being around family. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm smiling as I'm hearing you all talk about the traditions and the celebrations. And I also smile when you throw a little Spanish in there. You spoke slow enough uh, that I knew what you were saying. Uh, so I appreciated that. And uh, uh, as well as sharing a, a little bit about how, how you've been inspired as well. Uh, we're going to go and throw in the minty question, uh, the last uh well, I guess it'll be our last one. Uh, whom in your family or network of relationships inspires you? So we're giving the audience an opportunity to share as well whom in their family or network of relationships uh, has had an influence on them. And so we'll allow the audience to do that. We'll go back to the panelists uh, to go back to this topic of conversation. So we're going to run through. We just, got, we just received the virtual panelists, so now we'll go back to our in-person panelists uh, Mr. Tobias, we haven't heard from you in a while, so we'll start on your end. Okay. Uh, mine just sums up what I'm wearing right here. This was given to me by my father, and I'm very honored to wear it. It's called Familias Primero. And it's something that he used to wear a lot, I'm sure, when he went to his meetings and was given to him. And for him to give me that, it was a big honor. So, uh, again, taking care of your community, like Ms. Vela says, you know, making sure we uh, hear them, have those conversations. Uh, again, in our family, my family growing up with my brother Stephen and Ana Maria, uh, it was the family table. And you better not be late for dinner because we have conversations. And that's where it all starts, at the kitchen table. And you build from there. And then, of course, one of the traditions that we had growing up was our religion, was attending Christmas Mass. 
Okay. That's very important for our culture is to make sure that we had our religion and and that was a very important part. So that's one of the things that I remember and I would like to continue to instill in my family as well. Thank you, Mr. Bias. We'll go on down the, the, the dais here. We'll get uh, Mr. Benito in. Um, with Mom, on our celebration, we, uh, of course, get together with the family, uh, loud music, just like Claude. Um, uh, very tasty traditional pastries, food, of course. Um, but I, I, my most influence was uh, my father because of his work ethic that he brought into us. And, uh, and also my mom, you know, she did a lot for us. And uh, it just made the person that I am today. And I instill that into my kids. And uh, hopefully it turns out the same. But uh, thank you again for having this. I mean, this is very, this is, I'm an honor to be on this panel with these fine women and uh, gentlemen. And uh, again, I, I can't wait for the next one or anything outside this. It would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Benito. Really, it was an honor that you reached out to me to be a part of this. And I was excited to have you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ruben, we'll get you in next. Thanks, Dex. Um, I love Latino culture, not, not just Mexican culture, just the entire gamut from the U.S.-Mexican border on south. And I'm blessed to have a wife who, wants, who loves that too, and we love to explore things, uh, whether it be um, trying different foods like <coughs> mofongo from Puerto Rico or ropa vieja from Cuba or chimichurri from our, our Argentina. Uh, and different kinds of dances. Uh, last weekend, she took me to a, an Afro soca dance. And, um, you know, I can't really dance, but that didn't mean I didn't move. <laughs> um, so it, it's just, that's what we love to do. Uh, you know, I'm proud of my Latino heritage, and I'm blessed that my wife is proud of that as well. And so that's kind of what we do. That's kind of our jam, kind of our thing. So. Uh, and once again, Dex, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Ruben. Love it. Uh, we'll go, uh, Miss Angie, we'll get you in next. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're more of a, a Tejano family, and so unfortunately don't have like those experiences of all the different foods of Cuba <laughs> and all that. But I'll tell you what my family's like. Uh, my father's passed away. He was an attorney, and uh, I don't. I don't think he could. Uh, so most would say he he was my greatest influence, but he wouldn't have been the man he was without the mother that I had. So uh, he and 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 my brother and our families into cook-offs because one thing you may not know is Latinos show their love through food, and so uh, they our family loves loves to feed people and so they would compete so when people ask me hey angie like what's the best barbecue place in your county i'm like my dad used to win first place in, in state competitions and brisket it's kind of tough i don't know uh what to tell you but um on holidays yes here in kyle we have a tradition i have a very large viescas family that lives east of i-35 and so christmas is a big deal and it's an annual tradition but before my mother passed away, I would say Easter it was, a big, uh, it was the biggest one, you know, and she would bring like the relatives who lived in Dallas or other places that couldn't afford gas to get here. My mother made it a point to make sure everyone had travel expenses and were gonna be taken care of their entire trip because it was important to have all the tios and the tias and the primos. So I got to grow up very close with, my cousins are more like my siblings, they're brothers and sisters. So uh, yep, that's, that's all I'll, I'll share on that. But I was born on the 4th of July, so you can imagine that uh, that holiday too is a big deal in the Viescas family. <laughs> Very well said. Mm -hmm. You know, it sounds like a re uh, certainly heard mother and father quite a bit, but it certainly sounds like the, the mother uh, is a very influential yeah. part in the family. Uh, Dr. Octavio. Uh, thank you. Um, my family is pretty much a typical Mexicano family. It's kind of funny because we, we, I learned how to make este tamales con rajas from my good friend Veronica, but we also eat Welch food. Um, we celebrate Fourth of July but we celebrate Juneteenth as well. We celebrate these days of September and all kinds of different holidays from Thanksgiving to everything else. I mean, obviously we don't really believe on the, on the idea behind Thanksgiving. We call it more Friendsgiving, but it's just definitely, uh, it's, it, we're, we're a true, I think, family that really embraces multiculturalism 
and we really try to accept everybody. I mean, of course, you know, we eat menudo on Sundays while my wife is making French crepes. <laughs> so it's like things of that nature, and it, it, it's pretty cool. I, I think that's the biggest thing. I'm so proud of my of my family. When we look at it, just look at my kids, and I know it's hard to say this, but I mean, talk about when I see my kids and I don't see a bit of hatred or racism against any ethnicity, mm -hmm. any gender, uh, any gender, any sexual orientation. It is just amazing. It's like, okay, we did a good job yeah. doing this. So that's something I'm really proud of. Wow, thank you for sharing that. Man, all this discussion about food, and I haven't <laughs> I know. Man. Uh, man, all of it sounds so good. Uh, hey, Seuss, we're gonna get you in next. Um, I think one of the things I remember is just getting together with um, my family and Christmas. Um, I think that's just a deep-rooted Mexican tradition. Um, we all get together and we make great food, and I think that's the thing I most remember. So I'll just keep it brief. Who, who, I'm curious though, what's your, who's your biggest inspiration in your family or growing up? Um, I would say my parents and my grandparents. Honestly, everyone um, in my family has been a role model to me. Uh, I wouldn't. Uh, it, it's hard to pick one only. Well, good answer. D very diplomatic. I'm sure. I'm sure one day you'll be uh, just as inspirational to your family, though, as well, Jesus. And I certainly do mean that. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, absolutely. You've you've inspired me today, young man. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, uh, Coach Dixon, give us a, a 60 seconds or less response on, on uh, your in inspiration and any traditions you have. 60 seconds. All right. <laughs> so uh, inspiration uh, in my family is just my whole family because there's some that I see a lot. The reason why I'm here in Texas is because of my mom. Uh, she moved here um, and she inspires me uh, just because of where she's come from, literally from the dirt and to have the opportunities that she's had in her life to, to, be, to go around the world and visit and see things and experience life as no other. It, it's, it's just amazing what she has accomplished. Um, my dad, bless his heart, uh, he passed away a few years back, but just like what was mentioned earlier about our fathers working, um, he worked for the, <clears throat> for the uh, New York uh, transit system as a master mechanic. And uh, the day that he, his life changed was September 11th. Uh, he worked in the Twin Towers. Uh, that, was his, that was his base and he was off that day. And we just happened to be on the phone talking to each other. And his comment to me when the first plane hit was, that's probably the, uh, a religious faction I guess there was a Jew thing going on as far as the, the powers that be wanted to take over, you know, what was happening and this was their way of revolting and then the second one hit and then he basically said, I got to let you go. And I didn't see him or talk to him for almost a month. Um, but uh, he uh, passed away and going to his uh, funeral and talking to people when they saw me there, a lot of people were shocked. They thought, I was him, and um, which was kind of an honor to me because I never thought that I looked like my dad, but I guess there's times when my beard grows, I guess I look like him. But he had some traditions that, that amazed me. He was always about his family. His birthday, Labor Day, Veterans Day, it was family. Um, and uh, he set it up. He, he would do you know, go to the beach, hang out, do cookouts and stuff like that, or whatever was going on. It was always about his family. Um, and listening to people talk and realizing that my dad, I was wondering why he always had all this time off during the summer uh, to do and travel the way he did, and realizing that he never called in sick. Not one day, and he worked there for almost 45 years. He never called in sick. Uh, and when I went to visit him, he would go to work he worked overnight or so whatever it had to do to make it happen. And so that, that is probably where I get a lot of my strength from is my dad and my mom. Uh, they inspire me. But 
uh, just recently, you know, my mom calls me and she goes, so, your birthday's November 25th. Yeah, mom's there every year, yeah. <laughs> but this was especially this year because it's on Thanksgiving. And I was like, yeah, it's on Thanksgiving. And they're like, what are you doing? I said, I don't know, Mom. I'm not. Well, we're going to have something because it's your birthday. And, da, 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 and there's going to be food. I said, well, as long as you make arroz con pollo, we're good. But, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and uh, so you know, arroz con pollo and potato salad. You know, so I celebrate everything there. Though. I'm a simple guy. Uh, um, but uh, it's, it's, it's the, that camaraderie with friends you know, is, is priceless. I mean... Uh, you, you bring the word family, and to me, that's that just puts me. It kind of puts me in a in a rabbit hole because my family is, man, it, it's vast. Yeah, uh, it, you know, you, you put that term out there, and I just think about a lot of people who have ex- influenced me, and that I call family. And that's from coaches to parents, the players. Uh, you know, being in a wedding with a. Uh, a former player, and he calls me to be in his wedding, you know, just because of how our relationship grew with him and his family. Um, it's it's amazing, and I can never take those things back, and I never would because I, it's 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 priceless. I just can't put words to it, but I'd love to talk about it at any time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would love to continue this discussion, and it has been robust, and it has been in depth, and it has been moving. And I want to uh, certainly acknowledge our panel tonight. So a round of applause for our panel discussion this evening. This was extremely informative. And I can tell you all right now, I will probably be reaching out to some of you all to continue some of the conversations because some of the notes I was taking, I'm very intrigued uh, and, and want to learn more. Thank you all, certainly to our virtual panelists for being a part of this this evening, our in-person panelists being here today. Uh, I want to acknowledge our staff, our communications department, uh, Xander with our our slides, Grant with uh, working on the the camera and the interviews, our communication staff here tonight, our IT staff. This wouldn't be uh, um, come together without them, and I certainly want to thank my colleagues on council for always being supportive of of uh, having these events. Uh, This has wrapped it up for this year with the Dialogues for Peace and Progress. Stay tuned for next year and coming back and doing more of these. Uh, Certainly, we didn't get the last Minty question up, but if you're watching on Facebook, go ahead and drop some notes in the comments, your thoughts about this discussion, things you would like to see in the future. We're certainly open to feedback and continue to create content and dialogues that the community wants to hear and wants to talk about and wants to be a part of. So thank you all for that this evening, and I wish you all a happy Hispanic Heritage Month. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.